from Atlanta, Georgia, Bobby Hammond. Bobby Hammond will be doing a lecture at Wisdom Book Center tomorrow, November 1st, 2003. Uh, time, 1 o'clock, 2 p.m. sharp. And the topic of the lecture will be African Egyptian New Beginning in Our Time. Uh, we're here on Halloween night. Bobby Henry was kind is kind enough to uh, do a little Halloween Hemet for us. And um, some of the topics we're going to discuss is uh, the metaphysics of Halloween. Uh, and he also going to share some rituals with us concerning um, your health, protection, uh, things of that nature. Bobby Henry, how you doing? Um, in so many words, uh, <clears throat> there's several books out on Halloween. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm glad to be here in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I was here six years ago, um, about three or four times six years ago, about twice. But I have a history here. I had an uncle that was a big-time preacher here in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, he died in 77. I had an uncle and an aunt. Uh, that was that was a that was a great uncle. Let's put it that way. That was a great uncle, uh, uh, if you want to call it that. That's uh, my grandmother's brother. And then I had um, my mother's brother and sister here went to Morgan State here in the late fifties. So uh, um, late fifties, early sixties. So I uh, have a history here in Baltimore, Maryland. And as we know, we, we always call on different experts, especially if we can find some around the area that can give us a bit of history on, um, on Baltimore, because we're going to need this, what is the black history of Baltimore, because every, these cities are all have something to do with something. There's no city that doesn't have a history and was not built for a certain purpose. Give an example, I'm now here in Atlanta, Georgia. And they call that the Southern New York. Well, come to find out that after the Civil War, it was the Northern money that built Atlanta. So Atlanta um, later on would become, would become a premier city in the 80s and in the 90s and even starting in the, in the 70s. But it was, all, it was already a form of... Um, it was already a plan to build Atlanta as a southern New York. It's nothing like New York, but, it's, but there's nothing like Atlanta in the whole south. So we see a projected effort to make these cities into certain things. So we need to find out. So when you live in a particular city, you need to find out what is that city about, what is the history of that city, and what unique system or service or plan that that city used to have, and that's very key, especially for black people. What are going to be the slaves in the city? What's going to, how those particular slaves or those particular people are going to be, are they going to run the city? What kind of workforce? All this stuff is very important in these places that you live, metaphysically also. Let me give you an example, because when we say that, we say that is, um, the week before 9-11, I was in Detroit, Michigan. I was in New York on 9-11-2001. And by the way, this is Halloween night, 2003. And I was in, in, in New York City with, uh, on 9-11. A week before, I was in Detroit. And I, was, and I had lost my driver's license. Um, not lost them by driving. I lost them physically. So a brother fixed up this college ID for me so I could fly out because you needed some type of ID. So it put alumni on it and all. So it, it, it so uh, for two months, no, for close to a year it worked. I didn't even get, I didn't, I didn't even get in the license. And close to a year it worked. And right the week before 9/11, I was in Detroit, and the uh, when I went to go uh, get back on the plane to fly out from Detroit, they took my they took the the ID. And they, they took the ID and they said that um, uh, they called some personnel down from some office 
And he said, look, we're not really, we, we know that you're a, a, a Robert Hemet. We know this. We see that you're an alumni of this particular college. We need to know what state are you from? Well, I said, well, basically, if I'm an alum, I said, basically, um, I'm from the state of Georgia at this particular time. So your state and your city is where you're from. Not the United, it's the United States. But remember, America is not where you hail from. You, you, your country, this is what I'm trying to say, is what state you're in. Remember that. That's very key. Because you can go to different states and you're governed by different laws. So your country is your state. And in this particular case, um, where you are from is Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. So therefore, it's very key to try to understand a city and why you live in that city and what the government has um, um, for you. Um, going into the whole Halloween thing, basically Hallow's Eve is just like any other uh, tradition that they deal, that's the European tradition, but all across the world, they, uh, even in Mexico and in um, parts of uh, Asia, parts of India, and even in Africa, they always have what is called a Day of the Dead. The dead also represents the day of the ancestors, but it also represents the underworld, the hollow earth, the underworld. Now, it's not necessarily in metaphysics talking about a realm that's up under the earth, but it's talking about a realm in literally another dimension. That's the ancestral realm. And so every culture has a day of the dead or the, uh, uh, this Hollows Eve in, in Europe. That's the European form of the Day of the Dead, uh, 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 dealing with that particular ancestral aspect. Um, it becomes a little more elaborate, um, you know, uh, with the ghouls and the goblins and all this type of stuff. But, but, but still, yet, yeah, that's, the, that's the basis of this. So, it is, so this is a very important day if you understand and read behind the lines in the particular aspect that we honor the realm, the ancestral realm. Um, give you an example how we've been spooked out based on Christianity. Um, I have a skull in my living room stuck inside a black pot. So when people come in, they're automatically spooked out about it. Now, over the years, some of the meanings of these things have been lost based on time. But the practitioners still keep up to the tradition of those particular um, customs, although the, the, the real meaning could be lost in time. And that's what happens a lot of time. Then other cultures come in and because they don't know the real meaning, because some of the practitioners might not know the real meaning, they all relegate all this stuff into evil, or superstition, or bad. 98% of things on the planet, we always remember this, 98% of everything that we call evil is basically a misunderstanding based on time and historical ignorance. So what you would have is, you would have a certain tradition. And that tradition would, 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 would thrive in the land, and everybody would know the meaning. But hundreds of years would pass, sometimes thousands of years would pass, and then what would happen here is you would have later generations that would come in and not understanding the original meaning of something. And by them not understanding the original meaning, they'd automatically in history relegate it over to evil. Or rele relegate it over to bad. You see what I'm saying? Or rele relegate it over to taboo or forbidden. So this skull, what is the meaning of the skull that you see? Uh, a skeleton with bones that is, that, that is in voodoo culture, Palo culture, and in different types of, uh, of, of religious culture, that later on is relegated into evil. Especially in African culture. The skull, the bones, and the whole nine yards. But even in the Halloween we talk about, what would be 
the meaning. Well, the ancients used to understand that they would have to pay homage to the ancestors. Now, what is an ancestor? An ancestor is someone that is no longer living on the planet. So if they're no longer living, that means that their physical body have, has decayed based on death. So the bones represent the physical decayed body of the ancestors. In so many words, the bones literally becomes an emblem, a symbol, just for ancestors. It's as simple as that. But the spookism comes in it when we don't understand these things. And then we get Hollywood and we get all this taboo mythology that comes in and explain that this is evil. So automatically, the mind automatically accepts things as being evil when you don't understand it. Thus, we have the same thing with religions. One, man God, one man's God is another man's religion. Excuse me, one man's God, excuse me, is another man's devil. So, what you would have here is the same thing in religions. These religions come and things become evil. And things become evil because the prior practitioners of that, those particular systems somehow fell into obscurity. And the latter people did not understand it. So therefore, things get relegated into a degradation and even in meaning. So Rudolf Steiner, one of the occultists, even goes far as to say that religion, religion itself, comes about when vast cultures fall and, and lose the advanced idea of education and spirituality. What is left is splinters and pieces and fragments, and that's all lumped into religion. And religion is mostly political, dealing with moralism. Has very little to do with spirituality and the practitioners of the divine laws of the earth and manipulating the forces of the earth through ritual, which is magic, which is science. It has very little to do with that. Religions are based on political, behavioral modification and moral code mostly with a little bit of sprinkles of some forms of mysticism that's thrown in to make it seem divine. But it's only fragments of greater systems of education and spirituality. True spirituality most people think is evil just by the mere fact that you're practicing something on a higher level and it takes a little more work than sitting down begging and praying. You see what I'm saying? Uh, 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 and because you were trained in a tradition as a child in a religion and they call it spiritual, you automatically think that spirituality is what you've been getting all these years, which is moral code and a little bit of inspirational ceremony to make you feel a certain way. True spirituality has very little to do with moralism, very little to do with human behavior. True spirituality is tracking the spiritual realm that is unseen and manipulating the forces to bring about results in the physical. The preacher talks about having faith in the unseen, and the only reason why you have to have faith is because you don't have education in it. You don't have gnosis, knowledge in it. So there is a difference. This is the basis of metaphysics. This is the basis of, of occultism. The word occult just means that which is hidden. That which is hidden. So that's basically, uh, the, the, but, but going back to Halloween and these festivals, this is our form of the festivals that you have. This is a national form or a European form of the festivals that you would have in South America, in the Caribbean, in New Orleans, where they have festival or carnival or carnival. 
where you would have, in New Orleans, they have the carnival, they have a day of the dead. You see. All this stuff can reach back to Africa and the ancient civilizations. You see what I'm saying? And basically, you have that particular aspect in Hollow's Eve. And then you have All Saints Day the next day. All of this stuff here is nothing but American version of the carnival. This, 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 this watered down into ye mamby pamby going out and getting candy and, and little goos and goblins and jack o lanterns and stuff so the American psyche can take it. You see what I'm saying? Because the American psyche can't take anything out of religion because the religion says you're going to hell. You see what I'm saying? You're going to hell just by thinking of anything outside of being a good, obedient child. So in so many words and stuff, if you go to a church and they've been telling you since Sunday school to be obedient, to be good, and you now 50 years old in church and they're telling you to be good and pointing the finger at all the bad people, then in so many words, it keeps your evolution into spirituality and to understanding the universe into a retarded state. It has retarded and impeded on your process of going to a higher level, an impediment to go to the higher level. Because you're learning the same thing that you learned in Sunday school. And it's very little different from it. It might get a little more sophisticated in the particular aspect. You're talking about grown folks now. And you're throwing the black people now, which is prosperity religion. Now you're talking about um, praying so you can get a Cadillac. Oh, 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 excuse me, it's the 1970s, 1980s. Praying to get a Mercedes or a Lexus. You see what I'm saying? Um, and for some reason, you think that the reason why the person on the street are the people that don't have it. The reason why they don't have it is because they haven't somehow, they haven't prayed hard enough or they don't belong to the right church. They don't have the right preacher. You know what I'm saying? They don't have the right preacher. Which, it goes to show you that that is a form of um, inferiority in the particular aspect of a form of, 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 of historical illiteracy. Because all you have to do is just look at just the history of America, black America from slavery on up. And there's, 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 there's rare, rare, rarely any black people who don't believe in God and don't pray on the same manner. We must ask this question. Because you have... Um, this prosperity stuff now with all these mega preachers, Creflo Dollar, um, Fred Price, T.D. Jakes. There's one called Bishop Eddie Long down in Atlanta. Um, they got these mega preachers. They're outdoing each other. One of them just bought, one of them built a coliseum. Looked like a doggone sports arena to go to church in. They paid $70 million for a coliseum in Crenshaw Boulevard. And since we've been here in the hills of North America, we have never put $70 million in a damn business. But yet this fool going to put $70 million just in a building. Fred Price gets jealous. He goes and buy him a, D, a DC-10. You know, he go buy him an Air Force One. One other Negro preacher goes and buy the Forum in L.A. All the many white people done fought it in them seats. Now they're going to church. You see. Where did this prosperity ritual come from? And I want to know, well, if, if, if it's based on prosperity ritual and it's based on God, uh, um, um, you, you tithing and all this particular money thing, I want to know this particular question. What happened on the first 100 years of you being in the church on up to from 1865 to 1965 or 1865 to 1985 where you had money for the church and you took up your rallies but um, you didn't have all this crazy stuff based on prosperity in that particular aspect. As a matter of fact, people don't understand this. 90% of the preachers now are talking about prosperity and based on how much you tied, it's how much God going to get back to you, but they're the one that's getting rich. 90% of the preachers are doing this now, and that is the norm in most churches now. But isn't this interesting? 
Let's go back 30 years ago. 30 years ago, you only had one preacher in America that was signature to that, and that was Reverend Ike. And everybody thought he was a joke. You know what I'm saying? We used to laugh at Reverend Ike when he would talk about, you don't have anything, you don't know what to do with your money, send me your money and I'll know what to do with it. I can do a lot with it. And we was thinking that that was a novelty and somewhat of a joke and could be a form of embarrassment. You know, when we were in our right mind. But now all of a sudden, this is the run of the mill and this is, this, this is fashionable with every black preacher. Here goes again, we're getting caught up in things that have nothing to do with spirituality. Real spirituality, the modern world knows very little about it. That is relegated to the European lodges, the metaphysical and occult societies, certain bookstores and certain literature. But as far as the run-of-the-mill people, the masses of the people, both black and white, we don't get any of this on TV, and we certainly don't get it in the church, and we certainly don't get it in the public eye, which real spirituality is. So to understand that, you must understand the history of real spirituality. Real spirituality is a combination of an educational system put together in Africa, in Atlantis, Lemuria, which is nothing but different planes of the existence of the earth until we get into the physical aspect. And Africa happens to be a form of the physical aspect, but it wasn't necessarily the first because the first civilization was, in fact, all of the earth that had all one landmass. Because at one time, the earth was connected and we had one landmass. Most European scholars have proven that. Um, one landmass, one people. You see what I'm saying? Africa is one of the first places where we started documenting records. You ever, I often ask this particular question. We go to ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt, and we see these vast monuments all over ancient Egypt, all over ancient Kemet. We was at the Walters Art Museum today looking at the, the British Museum collection, and the Book of the Dead is here in Baltimore, and you just see these vast carvings of stuff that looks like it's from another world. And we see this vast civilization in, um, um, in Africa, on the continent of Africa, but we often shake our head and go, why didn't the rest of African civilization build vast civilization on that particular level as Kim? And although we do have pyramids on in the Nubia, we have different artifacts throughout the continent, Nothing on the scale of ancient Kemet. Well, the great mystery is here. Ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt came, in, came into being as one thing. When ancient Egypt was first comes into being, it's going to be a monumental state, a state of recording vast storehouses of knowledge and information. We were already at our fallen state. We were on our decline. This happens to also do with what we have to understand, the time cycle. Because now we're finding out when you study more and more that number one, we were, at, number one, we were here, if not thousands of years, millions of years. That's the first thing. Number two, we did not come from apes. That is a European concept and it is a contrived concept based on conspiracy with Charles Darwin being a commission to bring about this concept. Well, most, even black scholars at this particular time will, will say, well, no, we can't, we can't argue that because we have bones. Yes, you have bones, and there's different species of bones and different species of apes. But that does not mean that that's a species of men. That could be just various species of apes. That's why even Charles Darwin say it's the missing link. But my point here to, 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 to drive the nail into further evidence would be this. If we came from apes, 
the ancient Egyptians or the ancient Africans or the ancient indigenous person around the earth would have said we came from apes. It wouldn't have been no white man in the 1800s. We are responsible for history and knowledge on this planet. The Africans, the ancient indigenous black person around the earth. Everything that we know now is only a fragment of what they knew then. And yet, in my studies and studying them for the past 15 years, as I have never seen any ancient indigenous people who record everything, especially in ancient Kenya, say that we come from apes. So who am I going to take? A white man, Charles Darwin, based on a lie, so that they could cover up the history of black people being on, being on the earth for thousands of years, and when you ask the question, where did white people come from? They don't have a history that can even equate to civilization no more than 2000 B.C. Now, they might have been on the earth a little longer, but we're talking about outside of the caves. We'll give them a little bit of grease. And that was stolen. But the point I'm trying to make here is it's a conspiracy. So now going back, we're talking about the... It, uh, uh, that's the first thing. We didn't come from apes. But going back, we're talking about a timeline that is so remote until we can't even count it as far as the history here. And number two, we're not talking about an evolution into technology of today. We're talking about advanced technology that the ancients had, a decline of the advanced technology, and then now a re-emergence of technology that the European does and calls it technology the only time technology has been on the planet. Like I was coming in from New York the other day, I did a lecture in New York last week. I was coming in, it was me, a brother from Ethiopia, and then a white boy sitting next to us. And we was up in the clouds on the airplane. And the white guy said, you know, it's amazing. He said, think of all the millions of people that lived in the ancient times and in the past. They couldn't even dream of being in the clouds like this. And look at us sitting up here talking between the clouds. And I looked at him and say, uh, think of all the ancient people that was in the past. They could see what we're seeing in their own mind. And could astro travel at will any time of the day and see the same damn thing. You see, I said, think about that. I said, see, what, you, what you're doing, you're falling into this thing to thinking the only advanced state on the planet when people were able to do stuff that we do now is at this particular time with Europeans. And that's why the Europeans think that they're so superior over other people. It's number one, the ones that do know they hide the truth of our achievements and our superiority over them based on advanced technology on a whole nother level. And so it's interesting that you could get a white boy that was being innocent. He was not really being, you know, he, he wasn't in the conspiring realm. He was just basically, they think that way. They think that what they're dealing with at this particular time on the planet is the most advanced. And this is a conspiracy by hiding what fragments of the achievements that they can find and what knowledge they do have. They hide all of that and they only present the European model of what they call uh, technology. So in so many words, what they can do is, is they can have advanced and vast amounts of information that they have recovered from the Africans that was left behind in 16 universities left behind by the Moors in Spain, which is black Africans. And they can have all this particular information, but they would, instead of putting this particular information outside of the lodge to the public of this vast, advanced technology on much more advanced level than what they have now that they will never be able to duplicate, they would rather wait and figure out a way to get to the closest common denominator of what they can invent with their system of 
what they call technology than to give the people the real information on this advanced technology that existed before it. They would do this and wait for a hundred, they would rather wait for a hundred years to figure something out than to give you the blueprints of stuff that the ancient man have had that they don't know how to deal with. And so, so in so many words, when they keep coming up with these inventions, you say, the white man is great. The white man is great because he's the one that's inventing all this technology. And what he's doing is, is really not technology. In the particular as African sense, only thing he's doing is giving you more concepts of convenience. Things that you don't have to use the mind, things that you don't have to use the spiritual ability to do, you have to do with gadgets and technology. So we could dematerialize cells and be on one side of the planet in a few seconds and rematerialize cells and, 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 and travel physically from one part of the planet to the other. We could do these things. We have accounts of doing these things even written in our doggone ancient texts. You see, we could go to all forms of the universe and didn't have to leave the earth physically. We could go to those clouds and walk around in those clouds. Hell, they got mythology of people walking around in clouds. How the hell do you think they got the mythology of them walking around in the clouds? They got the mythology because they was walking around in the clouds recording the shit. This is what the occult knowledge is about. Now, because you haven't experienced it and because you haven't studied it, you can't say that this person is crazy and he's just making stuff up. You can only say this when you study this particular information. You see what I'm saying? When you study this particular information. And never ever on this planet Earth say that you are aware of the knowledge that exists. And the knowledge that you are aware of that exists is the only knowledge there is. Only a fool would do that. And never, never, ever feel satisfied with Western education to give you the fundamental basis of adequacy of knowledge. Because whatever they're going to give you is going to be inadequate. Because the simple fact they're only going to give you rudimentary forms of training to rule their society. You will never get true knowledge. That is left up to the lodge and left in the lodge in the upper echelons of white societies that have usurped our particular information and preserved it. Now, we're not saying that they have the key to knowledge in a particular aspect um, that the only way you're going to get the knowledge is to go through them. No, I'm not saying that. We have vast storehouses of knowledge because it's never lost. And you can tap into that particular information, but you have to get to the basis rudiments of what I'm talking about as far as now going beyond history as black people and going into the mystery. So in so many words, the things that I'm explaining now and putting forth and have been putting forth since, since um, uh, uh, when I started speaking in June of 92, and it'll be going on 12 years soon, but been, been, been working towards at least 15 years, um, the type of information I'm, I'm, I'm putting out and all is vast amount of information. It explains these particular greater forms of what we call mysteries. No, it's not even mysteries. It's higher forms of technology and higher forms of knowledge. And we have the access to that. And as a result of going through these particular higher forms of knowledge, as a result, we have now recovered just about anything we want to deal with at this particular time based on particular energies and knowledge and the know-how of these particular things. Uh, and it's a resurgence and a return of the ancient information. And yes, don't think for one minute that the Egyptians who knew that they were going to go into slavery 5,000 years before, they said it right in the Hermetic text that they were going to go into slavery. Don't think for one minute that they weren't going to put things in place, or they didn't already know that deep in our DNA are the archety archetypes of the collective unconsciousness, we wouldn't be able to recover this. Because after all, we're just the same people, reincarnated to this day. 
You see, nothing is ever lost. And in the Gospel of Thomas, which is one that never uh, found itself in the Bible or was taken out at the conference of Nicaea or those other eight conferences, tells you that in the last days all things will be recovered and there will be no mysteries that is hidden, secrets that are hidden or mysteries that were hidden that will not be revealed. So this is what we're talking about now is taking it off of a spook level where we can say that we are uh, um, unveiling the information now in this modern time, which is advanced science. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was talking with a white boy from the University of California, Berkeley someplace. And we just got into the thing about the occult or the metaphysical realm of Crawley and different things and all. And I was saying, well, you know, the Western man, you know, he always dissects things compared to the ancient man who would observe things. So the ancient man could go in and he could observe animals. He could observe human nature. And he could basically heal people based on observing the human nature and tapping into the elements around him to find out what needed to be done to heal this particular person or what needed to be done uh, to live harmoniously with certain animals or uh, what needed to be done to deal with nature. I said, whereas the Western man, which is the European man, would have to dissect. He would have to actually destroy nature and destroy thousands of amounts of nature and animals and life and even humans, which they do guinea pig on black people in the United States and around the world and indigenous people, to come up with an answer on how to cure and somehow cure the symptoms, but not the cause. He never is a master doctor. He's only patching up the symptoms. He is not a healer. But he would dissect things where the African would literally observe the nature and become one with the nature and would heal it and never have to dissect at all. As a matter of fact, surgery was the last resort. That's a person that's hurt, that's gotten an accident, and is dying right then. Now, they knew how to go in and do the surgery that way, but most of the time, that was not needed. So I was telling this white boy, I said, you know, you know, they can get certain aspects of, you know, they can get some corn. They can get some, some coconuts. They can get some grapefruits. They can get some, some twigs. They can get some, some plants. They can get different things. They can get a statue of this. They can carve this, and they can use this stuff in, put it all together on an altar in a tree, and heal your body based on what it is. And the guy said, now, come on now. You're going to have to come better than me than that because he's trained the Western way now. He said, now, you're going to have to come better. You're going to have to explain to me how somebody's going to get a coconut, a pig. Well, I don't want to say a pig, a cat, and sacrifice this animal and go get a bunch of stuff in nature and then go get a bunch of inanimate objects, which is vibrating. Yeah, everything vibrates on the planet. And heal someone without dissecting them. Uh, you know, how can he do that? Now, obviously, I'm sitting here in this restaurant with this white boy. Um, the knowledge of these particular, this particular methodology had been lost for thousands of years as far as the ancient knowledge of how it is done. But, The ritual and the tradition of the ritual was handed down from generation and generation that still worked. So here it is, you would have a priest would be dealing with certain spells and stuff, and he would have a tradition on what to deal with these particular spells and this particular ritual to cure something. But when you asked him the scientific way on how it actually worked, it was thousands of years before it was put together and all of it being handed down. The, the scientific measurement, they would not know sometimes. But they know it works, and it works over and over again. So the white boy was going to tell me, now you're going to have to explain to me how this thing works. Now, right then, I didn't know how the 
the scientific way on how this thing originally was put together when they originally conceptualized this particular ritual. But when the white boy told me to explain it right then, I explained it. I tapped into the original source based on the genetic DNA. And he said what? I said, well, if you're talking general, everything has force fields. Everything has force fields and everything is built up on different dimensions and different fields and different streams of energy. So only thing that the African had to do or the ancient indigenous person had to do was find something in nature that would correspond to that which is inside of the body. If we're talking about, if we're talking about healing the body, this particular one. They could find something in nature that would correspond to the heart, the liver, the spleen, the brain. They would find something in nature because everything has not only force fields and streams of energy, but there's always something in the, the, the plant world or the animal world that is comparable to that which is inside of your body. And the only thing he would have to do was to match up the force fields of that which he would find in nature or comparable, uh, uh, the, the comparable or that corresponds to that in your body. And they can actually heal the molecular structure, the cellular structure, the physical structure of your body by just matching up corresponding elements in nature. And the streams would fuse this stuff together and would actually heal without even going into um, dissecting the person or cutting the person open. And I explained it to the white boy that way and he couldn't say nothing because it was profound and it was the right way to do it. But I call it up on the spot because nothing is never lost. It is in our DNA. It's in the molecular structure. So this is the kind of advanced knowledge we're talking about on this particular level. Well, another form of healing was we have the spiritual realm, the spirit realm, which is now all taboo to people that's in religion. Religion very rarely does with the spirit realm. Just tell you to pray and believe it's going to be all right. But there was the spirit realm, and there was entities in the spirit realm, and those entities could come in and heal because they would be the doctors just like you have a physical team of doctors, there's a team of doctors working around the clock to save this person. Well, there'll be a team of spirits, team of ancestors, a team of spirit realm, a team of gods that could come in and could actually heal that particular person. You see, because the physical body is the most easy thing on the earth for the spirit realm to heal. So one of the things they would do is just take them, find out what spiritual entity or spiritual energy is his, his astrological, astronomical, cellular structure line up to, take him to that particular temp temple that, that is the, the, the guardian of the head of that particular temple on, based on what, what his zodiac or based on whatever his energies are. There's a different god that corresponds to his particular energy. Take him to that particular temple, temple where that god sits over his head, put him on the table, do the ritual and call down the entity, the entity come down there and knock it out in a few minutes. But we're talking about advanced knowledge and science. You see, and this is the stuff that is privy to us now. But you can't be messing around in faith. And excuses not to learn advanced knowledge by thinking everything going to be all right. You see what I'm saying? We are world-class people now. We are into the 2000s. You see what I'm saying? And this stuff now has come around. You see? And that's the type of science we are dealing with now. We have the science to deal and do with what we want to deal with. But then again, on the other hand, we can't be superficial about it. In this particular aspect of a lot of things that we really want is stuff that we don't need. Now, you can't be stupid about it. The comfort zone sometimes is not necessarily the best way to go. My point here is how much comfort do you want? How much comfort do you need? So let's not be funny with this mess. You're not going to get the spirit realm to finance your lunacy 
of trying to live like these white folks and all these other people around the earth racing to be millionaires. Let's be practical about this. It's not about that. It's not about that. Isn't it interesting that the stuff I'm talking about right now, a person who's been a, who's been a millionaire for years would probably be more interested in what I'm talking about now than broke people trying to be like them. You know what I'm saying? White people spend billions of dollars trying to find the secrets and the keys to the universe. They're following us while we're following them. Now, as a result, these things are opened up. There's certain powers and things that is open up now that we didn't even have 10 years ago. We have now. We just don't know we got it. Why? Because our model is still in the European's mind. We are still looking to be equal to him, and he's not equal at all. He's not equal at all. It's just that he has leveled us and everybody on the planet to such a low level to even just to look up and see the top of the hole is high enough for us, although we in a damn hole, because he has put us on the lowest plane and so, therefore, by us being on the low level, you see, it don't take much to please us. And then he's the one that's dealing with the illusion by thinking that we need every damn thing. You know what I'm saying? Take, for instance, I hardly see people that can barely live outside of a cell phone now. 98% of the people, it's literally a second appendage. It, second appendage. It's literally a new ear ring. But let's just think about this. Twelve years ago, they didn't even have cell phone on the mass level. Ten years ago, they didn't have it. Seven years ago, they didn't have it. They just started getting into it about six, seven years ago. But before that, nothing. So my point here is, 1990 was only just a few years ago. 13 years ago, and it wasn't a mass marketed thing, and we got along just fine, and we thought we were modern in 1990. We had just about everything, and we got along, and we functioned on the earth just as advanced as anything else. So what makes you think now that you, what makes you think now at this particular time you can't live without a cell phone? Now, I'm not trying to tell you that if, 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 if somebody gives you a cell phone or you got this kind of thing, it might be some form of convenience. But then again, I am trying to give you to paint a picture to illustrate on how a lot of things you don't really need. So when we're talking about these things, you can't put it in the concept of modern wants and needs because a lot of that can be insanity. You know what I'm saying? And I know this because the simple fact when you go to a spiritual level, not only do you not need them, you don't want those things. Full mind empty house, empty mind, full house. See what I'm saying? Why you think the girl in the ghetto got to have 4,000 earrings on? And a ring on every finger. That doesn't have anything to do with African symbology. <laughs> Why do you think when the unlearned of us get money, they go through it, and they buy enormous amounts of things and be broke. That's because they who have been lowered to another level, to a low level, think that more is better. More is not necessarily better. It's just more stuff. You see, that is the sickness of what happens when you take it to a low level. Give me an example. I live on a, on a street in Atlanta, Georgia, Rogers Avenue. And the architecture on the street I live on, about seven or eight miles across town, there's another neighborhood called North Highland and Candler Park. And the same architecture that the houses in Candler Park and North Highland 
that white folks live in is the same architecture that is on my street and two or three streets over from me. Because, you know, most black neighborhoods used to be white neighborhoods. But yet, our neighborhood just don't look the same as the white neighborhoods. Although I'm not talking about a ghetto. I'm not talking about trash and filth. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about on my street, there's nice homes. Real nice homes. They're old homes, but all of them are nice, and the street is fairly clean. They cut the yards. Hell, most of them cut the yards more than me. But when you go to the other side of town, the same architecture built by the same architects, somehow it just looks different. They give you a thing of the mindset. And it goes a little something like this. Black people, after they moved into those particular homes, those homes used to have what is called sun porches. Sun rooms or sun porches. They would have a, a house and they would have a porch built on to the side. Built on to the side and, and, and these arches and different things. All of them had different designs. Somehow when the blacks started moving in, they needed more room. More was better. So they screened in, just about all of them on that street, screened in the front porches. I put window, windows and, and stuff, and even boarded in some of them, and made an extra room. If they didn't screen it in, they made an extra room into those particular sun porches, and they messed up the original design to the house. So you got this house that don't look because something is wrong because what used to be this open foyer, this open porch is now glassed in or, or screened in or boarded in because, you know, black people need an extra room. Some people are actually living in the actual room that used to be a front porch because in our mind, more is better. So one neighbor did it and the next thing you know, it caught on. But yet we can go across town to the white folks that got the same architecture and all the architectures got the original design to them. And as a result, it looks better. I say that to say, on the other hand, you got to free your mind with the wants and needs of everything that comes out. And I'll give you an example. Everybody has a VCR. VCRs have been running the show for the last 26 years, at least the last 24, 25, but by 1980, people started getting uh, VCRs. Now, the DVDs are out now. Now, the first thing you're going to do to make the mistake, you're going to get rid of your VCR, which is going to be a mistake because you can't record on that DVD. You got to have a little more tech, not different technology, and that's what they're trying to do. The government wants you to get rid of the VCRs because you can record things and they understand that by you being able to record the, 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 the recording ability on a, on a VCR and a, and a, and a, and a camcorder and these particular cameras is different. You need more, you can, you can do the, uh, the, the, the technology on the DVD, but it's limited right now based on the accessibility of what you can do with a VCR. You know, certain TV shows you can record, certain documentaries the government will put on one time and say, if these niggas don't get it, they're not going to get it again. And you, if you got a, VC, a, a videotape up in there, you can record. You can't do that with DVD right now. And that way they can control what you do. You see what I'm saying? So this is a new thing. So don't get rid of your VCRs because you got your DVDs. But then again, on the other hand, you blinded by technology. You see what I'm saying? So these are some things here, you know what I'm saying? I just want to put that out there to let you know that this particular new energy and new knowledge that we're looking into, don't look at this particular stuff as an ends to a means for you to take the same road in trying to be rich like white folks or other niggas. This is not a race for the comfort zone. This is a race for spiritual survival. You see what I'm saying? Whenever somebody's all messed up out here, and no matter what you do, that VCR, that 
uh, that DVD player or that Lexus is not going to doggone heal these people, you got to know a little more things that's going down. You see what I'm saying? But all of this stuff is in the aspects of the occult and the knowledge of the forces of the universe that's much more advanced than that that we know of other than praying and sitting around saying, in the Muslim, Allah is the best knower. Uh, I'm going to leave it up to God. You know what I'm saying? That's like saying, I'm going to leave it up to nobody. Do you think for one minute, if you just thought about it, if you wasn't trained from a child, do you think for one minute did God even recognize you even living? When you walk past a dog on ant pile, and the ant is saying that Bobby's up there looking down at me, so I better behave myself, or I'm going to let Bobby handle it. This other ant about to eat off my foot, but I'm going to let Bobby handle it. But I'm standing up in the yard looking down at the ant pile, and to me it ain't nothing but a group of ants running around, and I don't know nothing that's going on down there. Well, that's about like it is with God. You will never know not unless you tap into your own energy, because that is where the heaven realm is. And the only way to know God, which is yourself, is it not written in your law that ye are gods, and the scriptures cannot be broken. John chapter 10, verse 34, 36. And that's the Bible. But that's the basis to esoteric stuff. You are the microcosm of the macrocosm. Then you best believe it's got something to do with you tapping in. So you say, well, no, I believe in God and the universe. Yes, there are forces that's on a greater mass than you, but you are the same force. We say, well, you, what do you mean? If I take a, a glass of water and go to the ocean and dip the glass of water in the ocean, is not, is not the content in the glass of water the same content that's in the ocean? It's the same. So whatever the heavenly bodies are, you are the same product. So if God is out there above, God is here below. As above, so below. As within, so without. So you got to understand these particular concepts. You know, these particular concepts. You know, um, this is what's going down. We're going to um, come back in a few minutes and... Uh, Still give you some introduction to the science that's going on. Thank you, Bobby Hedrick, for that beautiful uh, lecture. And we'll be back in a few. This is part two of Hemis Halloween. back on. Hmm? Yeah, but that's not. Okay. So, uh, to get into this, exploring what all this is about, give me a question as far as um, exploring what the occult is about. What is one of the, the questions that you think would be the most frequently asked? How can we, in 2003, use the knowledge of the occult to further our, our progress right now in this country. Okay, first you have to break that down into baby steps, <laughs> increments. Um, the first thing is, is I think that at this particular time, to draw in energy, I think that in any of your dwelling places, you should have an altar. That's quintessential, and most indigenous people around the world have, has, have, have altars. Um, it's only the Western religion factor. Basically, uh, Christianity and Islam, when I say that, because these particular ones, they're so hard. Christianity in Islam, they're so hard, uh, um, so hard on this particular aspect of the 
uh, hard-nosed uh, fundamentalism, and you can throw in um, uh, aspects of Judaism, although all of these particular religions in their infant state or uh, in their inception, they have all the ritualistic stuff about them. But in so many words, because they're so built on moralism and um, 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 making evil out of any kind of practitioner of the spirit realm, um, a lot of times the Western world uh, being the inheritors of this, and we being the people that was, this was forced on, we tend to basically um, not have altars. So we're not talking about uh, 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 giving you some alternative way to pray. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about building an energy conduit or an energy base within your dwelling space, in your home. That should be first and foremost. Um, first and foremost um, should be in your home. Most homes that would have an altar and a certain amount of energy would be protected from break-ins and, 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 and different things. Um, especially if you set up an altar and in this particular case set up a device for protection. Well, what is the device for, device for protection? Um, in so many words, do you know that basically if you set up an altar and you sat down and you contemplated in your mind what would be something as a device of protection? What type of object, what type of anything that I would say that I would want to put on this altar for protection? Do you know that the most powerful one is the one that would come up out of your mind? You see, we're not talking about old rituals and things that's been depleted because of some ancient priest put some formula together or some strategy together a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. We're talking about a new eon of energy and this energy is coming from inside of you. You are the ones that's returning to the lofty state. So therefore the most important ritual is one that you think up yourself. That would be one of the most important rituals. Um, I would suggest for some people, for bibliography purposes, to get, some, get, get, uh, get the latest book by Philip Cooper. Philip Cooper is a guy, he wrote a book called Magician. Now, I don't know if that particular book is in print, The Magician by Philip uh, Cooper. I think it's called Effective Studies in Magic. Uh, studies in effective magic, effective magic, but he does have one now called basic magic. And only thing I want you to do is to get the book, to study the book on a guideline on how magic is done, to just to get a simulation of the concept in your head. I'm not telling you to actually go and do what he tells you to do in the book. I just want you to get, if not his book, any book on basic magic and basic rituals and just to get a concept on how to deal with it or, or what's going on. But I don't necessarily want you to do what's in the book. Now let me explain. Stories like Barnes and Nobles, Barters, and all of these particular mass um, national bookstores have magic sections. There's a reason why the government feels safe to have magic sections in all of these stores because none of that magic works. So they can print volumes of books because number one, some of the systems have been defunct for thousands of years. Some of the magic that the system, traditional system that's still on, on the planet that's functioning, the magic has been depleted have been depleted. So they know that most of the stuff that you go and buy in those books, they don't work. That's why they sell them. But I want you to go and buy a couple of these books. 
just to get the concept of what all this is about. You see, what all this has got is tons of books out on, ba on basic magic, um, basic magic, and get the concept of what it's about. After you get a basic premise in your mind, then I want you to go in and start making up the rituals based on your own self. Anybody can do it. You just do what comes in your mind and have enough faith or have enough confidence in your mind to know that it's authentic and do the ritual that way. So basically, dealing with the altar, we're talking about draping some type of cloth over something in your house and the first two things after you drape the cloth is to start with two candles. We tell people these days to always deal with seven day candles. Hand me that candle over there so that the people would know what this is. Deal with seven day candles. Deal with seven day candles. Uh, it is safe to deal with seven day candles or any candle encased in glass. Do not use any candles that are not in glass. That's for safe measures. That's a no-no. First thing, because number one, you're not dealing with just something that you're dealing with a, a, certain, uh, a certain thing, a certain ceremony that, um, a certain ceremony that uh, you're going to deal with a few minutes, you're going to out in the counter. Some of these things might have to take days. Or some of these things might be, you might want permanent. But if they're encased in glass, they're safe. That's the first thing. So you want to start with draping something over uh, something wooden, preferable, but anything, a speaker, a table, or anything, and making your own personal altar and start with either one to two candles. It could be one, but uh, one to two candles for seven days. Um, Any particular color? <laughs> Um, at this time, I think that the most new age color is talking about, and I'm not talking about new age in the aspect of terminology, the, no, the most color, the color I would think right now to deal with in the now would, would be blue. I would think that blue would be one of the key colors. Um, because the universe which you call the triple blackness of space. It says in the book of the law, which was a book that was put, uh, came by an angel by the name of Awas, it tells you that uh, Newt, which is the great mother, say, I am black to the people who are blind, but I am blue to the people who can see. So I would say blue, um, but there's several things you can deal with. It's the, uh, red is a great time for a lot of high energy. White is always good. Green is good for money. You see what I'm saying? Green is good for money. Um, so you can start with saying, you know, yellow is good, gold. You know, but I would think right now what you would want to do, and I would say blue, but I would also say if you're going to build an altar, uh, take the color that you like. You know, everybody got a favorite color. So your favorite color should be the color that you should put on your altar because that is your inner self. We don't know why we like certain colors. It just is. You know, your favorite color is the one that you should put on the altar because what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with something that is uniquely you. And so that means that the energy is going to be directed to you and for you. Because it's becoming, it's coming outside of you. You're drawing out something. So start with the best color that you like. So I said blue, but you might like pink. But it's a great color. It's the color of the goddess Urzuli in the voodoo. You might like yellow. Well, that's the co color of the goddess Oshun in Yoruba. You know, you might like red. That's the color of the goddess Sekhmet. 
You see, in Egypt, you see, purple, the color of Osiris in some mythology, green, the color of Osiris, you see, your whites and your blacks are dominance. But then again, if you want to deal with some real deal power, get a black candle. You know, depends on what, you, what you're dealing with at the particular time, you know, what you're dealing with. Um, so, but you want to start with that, and then you want to find out what type of entity that you want to deal with or what type of, of ancestor. In this particular case, you want to deal with, let's start with the entities. Um, um, there's a good book you need to get called The Dictionary of Ancient Deities by um, uh, Charles Russell Coulter and Patricia Turner. Charles Russell Coulter, C-O-U-L-T-E-R, and Patricia Turner. And that book would have just about every deity on the planet. Go through it, you go through it, it's, from, it's a dictionary, and go through whatever culture that you that you feel you're drawn to and find a particular entity up and then let it jump out at you in the particular aspect of using that. You know, there's several things you can do. And then, you know, I want you to adorn your altar with personal items because that's closer to you. But I would also suggest put you, put you a plate on the altar and um, so you can put fruit Mainly because you want to um, appease a certain ancestor, a certain god that you're going to be dealing with. You see what I'm saying? A goddess that you want to be dealing with um, at this particular time. Um, I can feel safe for saying this we, because, because most of the people at this particular time right now should have some type of method of study. We're coming out of the age of following people. So the good part about me is, is I'm not interested in you following me a damn place. Um, you're coming out of the age of that, so if you're not going to try to study, then you might as well go on back to the ignorant world because there is no place for you in progress of doing things in the esoteric realm or doing something new if you're not going to check out the information and study. There's too much stuff on the internet. There's too many bookstores out here for you not to be reading. You see what I'm saying? Just remember this. It's not based on how, it's not based on what you read, but how you read. When you read these books, read these books by chapters, read these books by paragraphs, read these books from the index, if they do have index, or the elaborate contents. Start that way instead of taking a book and reading it from cover to cover. I found out in my vast library and my vast field of studying in the last 15 years, and you, you rarely learn that much by reading a book from cover to cover. You research books. Now, some books are novels, and some books can be, they're, they're written for you to read from cover to cover, and you can be inspired. But a lot of these books that we're talking about here, um, then you read things and all, they're like textbooks. You, if you read it from cover to cover, you don't really dissect it, and you don't really get into it. So I want you to read like you research. It's the best way to do it. Go straight to the source, and um, especially if books have index. You know, um, uh, especially if books have index. Uh, for, for those who can't read, there's tons of videos out here that you can um, deal with because we got to have that. We, we have people on the planet that's illiterate, and it's not just black people. So those who can't read, there's tons of tapes and ton, tons, of, tons of things that you can deal with to somehow help you along. I have over 200 tapes. Um, that you can that you can deal with. So we, we, we deal with that particular thing. Start with that as the energy basis at this particular point. As uh, start with an alt with the altar. Um, to, to to get a certain amount of energy. One good thing also too for you women, and for uh, men, but especially for women, if you feel that you're going to be in danger, do you know there's an old ancient science if you wear purple. That somehow that's a protecting type of um, energy. Let me give you another one. 
There's a, a black dog called Anubis. Uh, Anubis or Anpu. Um, that is in the, uh, what you call it? I think if you can shine the light here, I can show them Anubis. <laughs> Can you go up? Do you see? Can you see him? That's Anubis, or Anpu, Anubis, the black dog that's in the middle. Sometimes he's standing on on, on two legs. Sometimes he's on his stomach, on all fours. Sometimes he's seen as a dog. Sometimes he's seen as a dog head with a man, the man's body. You want to take the black dog Anubis. For some people that, 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 uh, that have a problem conceptualizing this thing, just think of a Doberman Pinscher, which would be the closest modern animal to an ancient Griffey, which is the, uh, the animal that it was taken after, an African dog called a Griffey. It would be a Doberman Pinscher, almost identical. Imagine, now you can, imagine... Anubis, or the Doberman Pinscher, for you people that study, just get you a, a picture of Anubis. There's several Egyptian books, and all of them have Anubis all on it. But you want to get a, a if you, what you want to do, let's say you're walking down the street at night and you want to be protected. Women, or men, because it's dangerous out here. Or sometimes it's not as dangerous as the news would, would lead you to believe. A lot of times people get in crime, they fucking around in places they don't need to be in the first damn place. You know what I'm saying? And you ain't got no convenience store, store wrapped around your waist. So a lot of times we don't get mugged and a lot of times a lot of that is in our minds. And the white boy has created a fear right in our black community that really never existed. Because I never run into it and I'm in all kinds of cities. But let's just say for protection. Because I'll give you one who sometimes you need to be protected from. It ain't your own people. But let's just say for protection. If you're walking late at night and you want to be protected, only thing you have to do is take the black dog Anubis that you're going to find in these Egyptian books, put him on a chain and a leash, and imagine him walking beside you. You don't even have to put him on a chain or leash. Just, uh, just imagine him walking beside you. I don't want to disrespect. Put, don't put the chain or leash. Just imagine him walking with you. Um, either as a, either, either as, as the picture of the, as a, as a form of the dog, the Doberman Pinscher, or the form of the man with the dog head. And have him walk beside you. And ask Ann Poo or Anubis to protect you. And you say, well, where, where am I going to get a dog from? I'm not talking about a physical thing. I'm talking about the realm of imagination. It's called creative visualization or imagination. So you imagine the dog Anubis walking beside you and guarantee nothing will be able to penetrate that protection zone. Another good protection, you're driving around at night, you don't want to be stopped by the car, you take Anubis. As him being on his stomach, prostrate, horizontal, and you take him and you put him on top of your car as you're driving. You won't have no problem with the police because he's protection. That puts a force field around the car. When you're traveling on a plane, I put Anubis on the plane every time I travel. You know, every time I travel. Or you can get creative and go buy you two um, uh, Anubis dogs and put them on your front porch. But if you, you better put them in stone because niggas will steal them. You know. But you can do several things like that to protect yourself. You know, to, to protect yourself. You can also take red meat, red meat, bloody red meat that you get out of the supermarket. And you can rub on all of your tires on your car. Just take the meat, take a slab of steak, and rub the tires. Get as much as you can on all four tires. Buy your, buy your four, four, four pieces, uh, you know, and, get, and get, you, get it in your hand, and rub the meat 
on all four tires, you won't get in no wrecks. You won't get in any wrecks. You know, rubbing on all, all four tires, and you won't get on any get in any wrecks. You see, um, these are these are things that you can do. Um, I spit the rum. You go get me the the alcohol. Four ways. What the first thing you want to do to purify your house is you want to learn how to the rum or some form of alcohol in four ways. And when I say in spit, I'm talking about like a spray. Like you, you take this and you go. You spit this four ways. And as a result, you strengthen the force field around you. You do this in your house and you can do this. Spit four ways in every room. Or spit in four corners. Spit in this corner, this corner, this corner. And this is where you bring a certain amount of energy to your house. Uh, you, you bring a, 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 a energy to your house. But if, you, if you're traveling in a car, this is good to spit four ways and ask the entities. Or the ancestors, your ancestors, to protect you when you're in your car. Because you don't want no smoky bear fucking with you. A lot of times we ain't talking about niggas. We talking about the white man. Or we talking about some old knucklehead nigga out here um, in some police uniform. You know, there's several things you can do. They roll up on my house about four days after 9-11 and couldn't even find my shit. It was embarrassing. They couldn't even find my house. That was on 9-11, 2001, and then on December the 19th, 2001, they rolled on me again and got the wrong fucking street. It was embarrassing. So there's things that you can do. There's, there's, there's things that you can do. Um, get you some green candles. Burn you some green candles for money. You know what I'm saying? For money. But let me tell you another thing also, too. The spirit realm said... A lot of times, for you people, it's moderate. The spirit realm indicates that a lot of times when you do these things, if you ask for currency, they run into problems because there's different types of currency. We just think of the dollar bill, but there's thousands of pieces of currency all over the planet. So they get confused when you say, I need some money. They're like, well, goddamn. You know what, Nigerian money? And it could have been money in the past, because they can see from the past and the future, what, you want some Confederate money? money? You just say money, hell, they got all different types of countries with currency. So in so many words, focus on what you want and ask the spirit realm. You can use the green candles for prosperity, but focus on what you want a lot of times to, to get what you want other than uh, focusing on the actual money, because it, it runs it, it runs kind of funny with currency, and that's what what happens a lot of time. That that hap that happens a lot of times. And basically, one of the greatest ways that the spirit realm works is they always put things in in your obstacle, put things in your way to, to to bring about the type of money or type of prosperity. It, it could be a person that'll come up and give you a great deal or something. You just got to understand when the spirit is working for you. Uh, you know, I tend to. Um, come into more money whenever I spend my last dollar. You see what I'm saying? Uh, which ain't, uh, which ain't very, which ain't a long time. Let's put it that way. Spending my last dollar could be, and I'm talking about the last dollar I got on the earth. Shit, that can be two, three days from now. You know, um, because I'm the brokest man in the Western Hemisphere. I'm so broke. Did they get ready to cut off my refrigerator light? So, uh, um, but, so my last dollar could be, 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 be Thursday. But I find out when I spend that last dollar, and literally the last dollar when it comes to my black ass, um, money tends to come or some type of way. Type, type, um, some type of way. Um, these are, these are particular things on that particular level. But what I really want you to do now as 
black people is somehow try to seek the meaning of where we are going. Why we're down here and where we're going. Seek out that particular origin. I think it's very key at this particular time for people to read ancient mythology. Mythology is the most advanced thing on the planet. If you don't think so, when you get some mythology and try to read it, you'll find out that it's very, it can get very complicated, you know, and it's some of the most advanced things on, on the actual planet that you can actually deal with at this particular time. You got any other questions? Yeah. Um, the movie The Matrix. Uh-huh. Um, Revolution? Yeah. What do you expect to get out of this movie? Um, I'm hoping they can bring uh, a better meaning or bring some closure to this illusionary world that we do live in called The Matrix. For you that didn't know, um, the movie was not just a movie that was a concept that was made when The Matrix aired in um, 1999, the first one, when they talk about the world that we live in being an illusion, something pulled over your eyes to hide you from the truth. That is the basic element that I have found in all esoteric teaching. I want to use that word esoteric other than metaphysical, um, which is a much more lofty aspect of something that is hidden. In all esoteric teachings, the basis of all esoteric teachings could be Egypt, India, ancient Mesopotamia, even Greece or whatever. The basic concept of esoteric teachings around the planet including um, Aborigine from Australia, um, West Africa and all. The basic concept is the world that we live in is an illusion, a series of events that don't exist, only in our mind or the wiring in the brain. The Matrix did not introduce this concept. This particular concept is at the heart of all religion. Even, even Christianity, where Jesus said, this world that I'm, the, the world that I am is... This world is not my, not my father's. I'm just passing through uh, this particular thing. You know, there's one part in the in, um, Gospel of Thomas, which, did, which is one of, one of those particular texts that somehow got thrown out of, of, thrown out of this work we call like, the, 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 the bi biblical canon. In the Gospel of Thomas, they say, well, tell us where the kingdom of heaven is. And they say, you won't find it looking for it. You see. So this is an illusion. So I'm hoping, and there's several books that you can get on it. There's a book called Dreams, Illusions, and Other Realities by um, Wendy O'Flaherty, which is a book to deal with all those particular forms of, 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 uh, of illusions. You'll find a lot of that in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, The Border Worlds, and this is being an illusion. Um, several things. There's scientific books like Michael Talbert's, Holographic Universe, which is an excellent book, um, Michael Talbot's Holographic Universe. So there's several books and all that deal with this all being an illusion, um, you know, uh, and all and from the ancient um, from the ancient world, um, um, from the ancient world, it's being a, being a, being an illusion. So I'm hoping that somehow they deal with that particular aspect. I hope they don't get caught up in too much action. And in so many words, them pairing off uh, like I'm afraid they, they give the plot of the movie on Charlie Rhodes about um, about a week before the movie aired, the last one, Matrix, um, Matrix Reloaded. Uh, they said it's going to be somewhat like a truce between man and the machines, uh, you know, and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that they can get closer into... Um, um, somehow some form of freedom outside of the matrix than um you know just trying to um me like everything is everything is the way it should be and you know, all you know what i'm saying if he said something at the beginning of the movie when he said something was wrong with the world we didn't know what it was when you need to really deal with that particular part that's wrong with the world you uh, just wrong with the world so we'll see how that particular 
aspect goes. There's, there's two good books out on it. Um, one is called the, uh, the Philosophy of the Matrix. Um, the, the Philosophy of the Matrix. And one is also called the Red Pill. That's the second version of the book. So this is a big phenomenon. It's interesting because this, these movies are coming up on several time zones and different things that's happening. Um, there's uh, uh, types of lineups. There's cosmic lineups like um, harmonic concordance, which is a, a cosmic lineup that is going to happen on the 7th, 8th, and 9th. So it's interesting they dealing with this, this, this doorway of the 5th, which is that Wednesday, but um, that Friday is when really the movie public goes to see this movie, although they're going to open on the 5th that Wednesday. You best believe that when they go see this particular movie, the last one, it would be smack dab into this harmonics concordance, which is this cosmic lineup, which is going to be a lot of things affecting the planet. All of this stuff that's going down right now, so we're looking forward to that particular aspect. Yeah. Okay, Bobby, um, since we're closing out this year, what has been the most profound um, situation you have found yourself in this year that, that has made you grow? Well, basically, you know, I've been, I've been hitting at this thing for years with breakthroughs. Um, trying to get break, well, trying to get breakthroughs all of the 90s, where the vast amount of information was the recovery of information. And the recovery of myth, uh, information based on the theories of all of this of what the ancients said was supposed to happen when a person follows spiritual paths. And amassing all of this great information, all of the 1990s is what I did and worked hard at it. And um, experimenting, trying to find breakthroughs, the breakthrough to another reality. Long before the movie The Matrix, but the breakthrough to another existence. Um, those broke breakthroughs started paying off in 2000, 2001, 2002, and yes, 2003. So I'm on the, on, on the several stages of breakthroughs spiritually. In this particular aspect, we're talking about um, going to a certain level where you have an entity incarnate inside of you. Now that sounds spooky. That sounds like an alien movie. But the concept on what I'm talking about here, the entity that's incarnating inside of you is not an alien from outer space. Although it is an alien in your body, that particular entity that incarnates inside of you, based on metaphysics and based on the esoteric teachings of the ancients, is nothing, none other than your soul. Understand the difference. Everyone down there has a spirit. And 98% of what we deal with in the spirit realm is based on the spirit according to your body. But the soul is something totally different. The soul is where the spirit comes from. The spirit is merely a simulation of the soul. It is merely the energy that houses the soul. And the body houses the spirit. The soul is literally another universe and another entity within itself. It is an alien. It is the real you outside of the dream of who you think you are. The spirit has to deal with the dream and a series of illusions and a series of energies is cast off from the dream. But the soul is that which is really dreaming. Once the soul starts to wake up, it's the difference, it's no different than a new entity or a new person waking up inside of you. Although it has been, it is who you really are. The other part of who you think you are is what you were when your soul was dreaming. But when your soul wakes up 
you become a whole nother person and your dreams subside and your soul becomes the driving factor. In my particular case, the last three years from 2001 on up into now is my soul has had a series of awakenings. In the particular aspect that it's coming of age now until I've had two bouts of going to no self. No self is when your complete identity of who you are on the earth disappears and you don't even know yourself and the world around you becomes insignificant. Um, in so many words, I've been going through these particular processes and the soul has start to wake up and start to come to another level of adulthood in the particular aspect of completing itself to go into this new entity. That means this new entity is none other than a superman. And the superheroes that we have, you know, the word hero comes from the Greek, the Egyptian word heru, which is the Christ. Heru in Greece is hero. And that particular hero, a heru, is a supernatural, a superhuman being. And in so many words, that's what you're coming into, more advanced beings. So I've been become, I have been evolving more and more in partic those particular, um, 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 in that particular energy. Um, and some of the things that um, help with that energy, I know that that energy is dealing with is I'm much more affected by certain things like when Mars came the closest to the planet. So I've been more, much more affected by it. They had two solar flares or, or solar storms on the sun um, um, starting, I think, last Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. These solar eruptions or these gases and stuff. So I was affected by that in the aspect of the solar things. I, because there were gas and erupting, it, it, it erupting, I started cleansing. You see, um, I'm a, and the, the Mars coming, which is, represents the pineal gland, so my head started pulsating. And these are things that's actually coming online. So I'm actually affected, affected by certain things that is happening in the cosmos and in nature and different things like that. So, so these are some, so there's several single events that's actually going down. You know, like I said, you got the fires out in California. That's not by mistake. And let it be known that those are entities. Those are entities. Give me an example. Smokey Robinson fulfilled his name the other day. Why would he be named Smokey? And all these years he's named Smokey. And this dog on fire came in and burned up thousands of homes. And got the Smokey Robinson house. And doubled back. And even the little flares of fire that was flying in the air would hit his yard and go out. And as a result of they stopping that smoky house, he saved a whole block of houses. That's because of who, the energy, number one, of the black man. And the energy of being smoky and being an entity that gave joy and gave a certain amount of energy on the muse level. His energy was so strong in the name Smokey. Well, what does Smokey Bear do? Out in forest fires or protect. The word Smokey was enough, and the energy of who he was was enough to save his house in other people's houses and stuff, because that's the kind of level we're going on to, because he's an indigenous person, which means he's a god. And so therefore, he had dominion over the damn fire, because the fires were entities. There's a lot more going on than you think. Those are entities. Those are spirits. You see, those are spirits. So it's a lot of things going on in the universe and in the world. You see what I'm saying? But you, first of all, your monitor and your meter cannot be anything based on what you call the regular news or what you've been trained. Now, I can watch the news and find out where they're going based on the lies, but your perception of the world around you cannot be given to you by the enemy about the people that's trying to keep you entrapped in this particular form of illusion. You see, you have to think on a whole nother level also to tap into the spirit. You see. Yes. Mm-hmm.
Uh, my next question, uh, we had talked about it uh, a little bit uh, while we were out doing our little traveling about the smooth jazz. Uh-huh. Uh, what can you tell our audience about uh, what uh, role they're trying to, uh, quote unquote, brainwash us on with the smooth jazz? Well, it's, it's more of trying to control the muse. The muse is actually an entity that lives in our basic molecular structure and within the melanin, which is the, which is the lifeblood of black people. These muses, melocenes, these things are much more advanced and there's a lot more uh, um, 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 things in the ancient world explaining these things. And so the, the muse is something that is drawn out of people. They also knew that the muse, when you get the word music, or do you get the word amusement, or museum, they understand that we would create, it creates for the body what the body needs to heal itself in a time of crisis. So that's why some of our greatest music came out of crisis. You see. So the government understood that the muse is a very active an intricate part of the inner workings of the soul. It is the soul's language to humanity through music. Not only coming out of man, but going back in man because there's because the muses are always people with talent that can help other people. So your talent helps other people's muses respond, which is nothing but the inner workings of humanity. In this particular case, the most highest form is black people as far as the, dealing with this, how this muse realm works. So therefore, they must always retard it, guard it, and keep it under close wraps. So Motown, um, they had a, a, the, the Funk Brothers. The Funk Brothers was the guys in-house band for Motown. Um, and I was in Detroit a, a couple of, about a month or two ago doing a lecture, and one of the guys said with the Funk Brothers, who was, was the in-house band of Motown, who basically did all the music for most of the acts and all the great stuff you, got, you, you dealt with, they never went to a lot of the other major recording studios because they stuck as an in-house band. As a result, um, the government was very interested in their whereabouts and what they did. And I met one of the brothers who used to hang out with them, who was a close friend of theirs in Detroit, and he said that it was interesting that the government hounded them from the very first, from the very start, the government the CIA and FBI, the FBI is always on top of these brothers, always wanted to know where they were. You see what I'm saying? It always kept a close surveillance. So, surveillance. So, they, so, so they, they get on top of the music. In this particular case, if they can distort the music, like take for instance, 98% of most music that we hear now is sampled music from the past. This is a way to make sure that the muse don't progress into the future. The other part here is, is a modified, homogenized, pasteurized, watered-down version on a lesser repertoire of a deepest, of the deepest type of sophistication music can be. You got the opposite. So smooth jazz is a simulation of jazz. It's more instrumental R&B. It's gimmicks that sound pleasant more than complex rhythms to inspire to a new paradigm. There's a difference. It's the lesser repertoire. You can have a gimmick, something that is repetitious, that becomes a theme music for a background of 
other than a, a, a breakthrough music to catapult you and jolt you into the future. There's a difference. There's a difference between gimmicks. For all intents and purposes, rap music, although it's, the, it's, it's one of the greatest phenomena on the planet, 98% of it is now gimmicks. Because the music part is nothing but fragments of stuff that was already made in the past. So that's the gimmick. The real deal talent that used to go into rap, because rap used to be very complex and talented now, is now going over to the lesser repertoire rappers who is mostly gimmicks now. And we say this because 90% of what is in the black community now is either rap or some other rep lesser repertoire of music. The great R&B, funk, R&B, the real deal stuff now has basically been suppressed. It's been suppressed, you know, compared to the spearheaded music that we had throughout the, throughout the past. Most of the stuff now is gimmicks. It's a simulation of the real thing. You see what I'm saying? And all of the tunes and tones and melodies are designed not to reach into the inner ear nucleus of melanin. So you can hear music, but not necessarily receive music. You know, you know, you can have a light on in a room, but no artwork. It's the same, it's, it's, it's quite different. The artwork can be a doorway to another universe or to another reality. But to have a light on the room with four walls, although the light is on in the room, you tripping off the light because you got light, don't necessarily mean anything. But it's the same thing by having noise playing all the time compared to having something, you see what I'm saying, that is inspiring or something that is uh, something that, 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 that is going to... Uh, going to uplift or going to nourish. You see what I'm saying? It's just something that goes along with just having noise each day. You see? But you can't go deeper into the complexity of it. And even with the smooth jazz, it's really quite simple. You see? It's really quite simple. You see? There's nothing profound in it. You know what I'm saying? So this is all government simulation here. Keeping the people at a certain level. Keeping people at a certain level. You know. It's, it's, it's no more than religions. Everything is always good. Behave, behave. Monitor everything as being nice and based on your behavior. And everything that has any type of flavor or characteristic to it our difference is bad, and we can't tolerate that. You know what I'm saying? So therefore, the soul never wakes up because it's not being jolted to the next level. You see, so there's a great conspiracy going on, especially with melanated people, you see, um, because we are the creators, you know, different aspects of that. Give me some more questions. Uh, my next question um, has to do with the uh, Oak Crow. Why are you using this? Why are you using that as? Uh, okay, we have several elixirs. What we found out was is you have what is called a spiritos. A spiritos means spirits, the spirits. That's why they call liquor spirits. The art of distillation did not come from the European. The art of distillation came from the alchemical. Um, disciplines coming out of ancient Egypt, the hermetic schools, the schools of Tehuti, the priesthood of On. And they, the art of distillating grains, wines, fermenting barley and hops into beer. First beer is made into Kemet. Um, the idea of, of fermentation, fermentation and distillation and fermentation is an alchemical art form that comes out of ancient Kemet. And alchemy is the highest art form of the Egyptian royal art. 
That is the highest level of, of, of what you call, even uh, uh, of Kemet, or uh, of, uh, of the African mystery system. Because even behind the gods is an alchemical process, which means alchemy is the breakdown of the particles of the universe and the particles in man. And ultimately the study of melanin but also in the particles in nature. So the art of distillation was given to the European by the Moors. And what had happened was is in 2000, late 2000 and then in 2001, I started mixing different alcohols together based on the spirit realm that gave certain things, um, gave, gave certain things. And as a result, these became medicinal. These became medicinal. Um, but there's also certain things, uh, blended whiskeys that was old, this is from 1835, Old Crow, blended whiskeys from Kentucky, bourbon whiskey. Um, you know damn well, 1835, some slaves had something to do with this in, uh, in that culture, in Kentucky, damn sure. Um, so in actuality, but we're talking about something made on this particular continent, so it's a very powerful elixir that can be used for medicinal purposes also. Um, also, we do have to say that you have to call on certain entities also sometimes to, 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 to get the higher level of, of, of these things working. Like uh, the entities, oh, teacher T.H. Sheola, that came through and gave me these different elixirs and these different um, um, products for medicinal healing, you know. So uh, this is just another one that I got in the shelf of several other elixirs. Okay, when you say healing, uh, uh, could you name a few uh, uh, A few. Just, yeah, just name a few of the things that could heal, you know, on a, on a physical level. Um, um, just about anything, because you, because it's not really, this is, the alcohol is only opening up a gateway, in this case, for entities to come in and heal whatever you want. You see what I'm saying? And heal whatever you want. Um, you have to ask the entities. You would have to ask the entities. It's very key. Um, like I said, these three entities, Otincha, T.H., and Sheola. There's another one called Alcala, Queen Goddess Alcala. There's several ones, Otincha, Tia, Sheola, Alcala, Lokeo, you see, uh, Nisaba, and um, Althea, Lukea, Owalinsu, and Lalila. You see, these would be entities that you can use. Artemis, or Artemis. And you get the tape and rewind it in here. What I said, Otincha Th Sheola. I'm giving you all the goddess energies of this. Otincha Th Sheola, Lokeo, Queen Alcala, Queen Goddess Alcala, or Alcala, La Lila, Owalensu, Artemis. Um, uh, 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 some of the ones that you can deal with a call on these particular entities get them off the tape that you're hearing and um, you call on these entities or call on at least three of them and basically you can have them to heal what you want by taking a sip or either taking their licks and putting on what you want it to put on and I'll give you an example a brother called about a, about, about a son that, that he Says so not walking, has cerebral palsy, but his motor skills and everything is going right. He's like one or something, but he's just still not walking. So I told him to, to, to call on the Otincha T.H. Sheola and Alcala. You see what I'm saying? Or oh, there's other ones I just named. And um, um, anoint his back with the elixir. In this particular case, the elixir was um, Gardens London Dry Gin. Gardens London Dry Gin and a Windsor Canadian whiskey. Mix it together for the elixir, which is, which is the premium stuff in the aspect of, of what they first came down with 
Gordon's London Dry Gin, or any London Dry Gin, and Canadian whiskey. Oh, but I said, when's a Canadian whiskey? And mixed it together, and I told him to put it on his spine, put it on his legs. You take a sip and specifically ask these entities, tell them what you want done, just like you're talking to a relative. And it's in the bag. The other great mystery to this thing here is you can't do shit just to see whether it works. You got to believe. In this case, you got to know because you're going to have enough information and enough knowledge to understand that these spiritual things work. So you got to know it works. And that's going to be the magic. That's going to that's, that's gonna be the magic in how you get these particular things to work, you know, on that particular level. You know, um, but th those are some things you can, you can actually do. I told two brothers, I said, interesting because this brother is doing this for his son. I told two brothers in the last three years that I could get them out of wheelchairs. Even before the elixir thing came, I told them to read some couple of books on the chakra system and learn about the chakras in the kundalini. There's a book called The Chakras in the Kundalini. And I told them to learn. I told them to learn about this. And I told them one guy in 2000 and another brother in 2001. I told both of them that I could get them out of the wheelchair to get back in touch with me. These brothers never got back in touch with me. And one brother I met a year later, and he didn't even read the book I gave him. And the other book, brother... It's so disillusioned that these doctors are going to have him walking. He didn't even remember I told him to get him out of the chair a year later. And as a result, they're still in wheelchairs. But when the energy and all the information came to do it, I was already telling the brothers I could get them up out of the wheelchairs. And now the information and the knowledge is here. But these niggas here is waiting on these white folks to invent new types of technologies. Because here goes again. He has put himself as the criteria of knowledge and, and, and technology and progress and healing in your mind. And so therefore, you don't walk and you don't live. Whereas, if they did what I said, they all of them could have been walking right now. Because it's going to be the spirits, man. I told you at the beginning of the thing, the spirits work on you. They were going to do all the work. And these, this, 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 these spiritual elixirs are just a gateways for them to come through. Thank you, Bobby, for um, coming to Baltimore and, you know, bringing your, your powerful spirit and your energy here. And um, hopefully um, when people see this tape, they, they will definitely get some more spiritual and cosmic knowledge from this and uh, from the All-Seeing Eye Production Chambers in Baltimore. We'll call this a wrap. Ashe. Ashe.